Molt bona tarda a tots els presents i a tots els assistents a través del sistema informàtic, que una vegada més volem agrair a l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans i als seus tècnics l'ajut que ens presten per poder fer reunions híbrides, a la vegada presencial i a la vegada telemàtica. Això té un petit problema, i és que redueix l'assistència presencial, però té l'avantatge que arriba el missatge que volem trametre a moltes més persones. Per tant, novament, agrair a l'IEC aquesta dedicació que té, que puguem fer reunions, com dic, híbrides, a la vegada presencials i telemàtiques. Avui tenim el Gero en Vandenberg, que ens parlarà del tema que teniu a la pissarra, A Path to Effective Climate Policy Implications for Spain en Catalunya. Però abans, com és habitual, us vull recordar les activitats de la nostra societat, de la Societat Catalana d'Economia. I no us espanteu, però d'aquí a final d'any tenim, de moment, quatre actes preparats. Us els diré, faré un exercici de memòria, després els podreu trobar tots en el web o el blog, que n'hi diem ara, en el blog de la societat, picant sce.iec.cat, allà trobeu les nostres activitats previstes. Us les diré, perquè les recordeu, el dia 16 de novembre tindrem la visita del director de l'Instituto Valenciano d'Investigaciones Económicas, acompanyat del director d'un treball que han presentat fa alguns mesos, sobre implicacions econòmiques de la capitalitat de Madrid. Està vist des del punt de vista dels valencians, és a dir, no és un estudi que representi una posició política defensiva i agressiva. A més, l'Institut Valencià d'Investigacions Econòmiques es caracteritza perquè té un gran rigor. Els que vindran són el professor Francisco Pérez, Paco, pels amics, Paco Pérez, i el director del treball, que es diu Ernest Reig. Això el dia 16 de novembre, és un dimarts. El dia 23, una setmana després en col·laboració amb la Institució Catalana d'Estudis Agraris, a l'ICEA, una altra entitat membre de l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans, en Lluís Franco, que ha estat el director del Consell Econòmic i Social de Catalunya, ens parlarà sobre mercat de treball i territori a Catalunya. És un acte conjunt que fem amb l'ICEA perquè precisament vinculem el tema laboral amb el tema territorial. Bé, no ho farem nosaltres, ho farà en Lluís Franco, que per tant té experiència en aquest tema a l'haver estat durant bastants anys director del Consell Econòmic i Social de Catalunya. Dos dies després, el dijous, dia 25, ens parlarà en Jorgos Calis, que més que parlar ens presentarà un llibre que ha publicat ja, que es diu Límits. És un llibre també relacionat amb el tema que parlarem avui, que ens parlarà avui el professor Jerome Vandenberg. I això serà el 25 de novembre. I després, el dia 9 de desembre, tindrem com a Societat Catalana d'Economia l'acte social més important, que és la Junta General, una espècie d'assemblea no tan important com la del Barça de dissabte passat i de dissabte que ve, però també serà la nostra assemblea per discutir i comentar els temes que afecten a la societat. Immediatament després, el mateix dia 9, després de la Junta General, tindrem la conferència que ens donarà el professor Sergi Vasco, que per presentar-nos la seva obra de bombolles immobiliàries, una obra que ha estat guardonada 
pel jurat, ha sigut considerada pel jurat del Premi Societat Catalana d'Economia com a mereixedora del Premi Societat Catalana d'Economia 2020. Aquestes són les quatre activitats que de moment tenim programades, no excloem inclús que en fem alguna altra. Per tant, ja veieu que la nostra societat té forces activitats pensant en així col·laborar amb la difusió i, en el cas del premi, amb la promoció també de la recerca científica en economia. Dit això, que és el que toca pels dies venidors, Només dir-vos que ara heu vingut a escoltar el que digui en Jeroen Vandenberg, perquè sapigueu qui és en Jeroen Vandenberg, passaré la paraula a en Joan Martínez Alier. Acabada l'exposició, ells dos, però sobretot en Jeroen Vandenberg, atendran a les preguntes que fem tant des de l'auditori d'aquí, de la seu de l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans, com els que feu els que esteu connectats informàticament a través del xat, del xat que teniu en les vostres pantalles. Dit això, Joan, si vols presentar en Jerem Vandenberg, abans, deixeu-me acabar, agrair amb ells dos la participació, la voluntat d'estar aquí i de transmetre'ns el seu coneixement. En en Joan Martínez Alier, us vull dir que a part que molts que ja el coneixeu, és també dins de la nostra societat el president del grup de treball d'economia ecològica i política ambiental. I per això per mi és un honor que estigui aquí al meu costat presentant en Joan, en en Gero en Vandenberg i col·laborant amb les tasques de la societat. Endavant, Joan. Bé, estic segur que fer una presentació així solemne seria una cosa que que en Jeroen li semblaria molt estranya, perquè som amics i ens coneixem de fa bastants anys, i solament pels que siguin nous aquestes activitats sobre economia i medi ambient, economia ecològica i política ambiental, com hem dit el grup aquest dins de la Societat Catalana d'Economia, dir que no sé quan va començar a escriure, però fa anys, i jo me'n recordo de les primeres coses que va fer va ser o va editar un handbook of environmental and resources economics que em sembla que és dels pocs handbooks que acostumen a ser bastant no gaire, no tenen gaire èxit normalment, no? Perquè són una mica ensopits i aquest en canvi és un handbook que a mi em sembla que sí que ha tingut molt èxit perquè està fet amb molta molta feina i molt ben triat tot i combina el que és una economia ambiental més, diguem, per dir-ho molt breument, neoclàssica amb noves idees de l'època sobre metabolisme social i conflictes ambientals que jo me'n recordo que va ser la meva contribució al handbook. A darrere d'això, que no sé de quin any és això, però deu ser l'any 80, quants? No sé, no? Aquest llibre és del 99. 99 ja, però ja estava en plena activitat i llavors ha continuat, no sé, no cal dir gran cosa per la gent, que la societat catalana d'economia és una societat científica, com l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans és una mena, jo crec, d'acadèmia de ciències catalana molt modesta, com podria ser, suposo, la d'Eslovènia o un país petit, no? I la seva vocació és aquesta, perquè no hi ha una altra, per tant, com científics, el que tots coneixem bastant és el tema de publicar i de sortir a Scholar Google o a Scopus amb molts articles i amb aquesta mena de competició, que és molt diferent de les que juga el Barça, per exemple, és perquè no guanyes gaires diners, tampoc en perds tants, diguem, doncs el Joan Vandenberg és una persona sumament coneguda amb el camp aquest de l'economia i el medi ambient i la política ambiental, que és el que ens explicarà ara mateix amb les seves pròpies paraules. A més, és un professor i crea, que clar, tots els que estan a la sala ho saben, però potser no tots els que ho estan escoltant a fora, li crees una idea molt bona que tothom sap que més o menys va tenir el Mascolell i que va convèncer el govern de Catalunya a la Generalitat 
quan era a conseller o abans, i és de portar a Catalunya gent de fora assegurant que farà bon temps, diguem, que el clima és bo, que encara no fa massa, massa calor, i que no sé què més es pot prometre des d'aquí, diguem, el clima és segur que és bo. I que, a més, tindrien prou diners per fer una feina de recerca. I no sé quants són, els hi crees ara, potser 150 o 200? 250. 250, és increïble el que això representa per a un país petit. Trencar amb aquesta mena de diguem, de sistema antic heredat del franquisme, del Consejo de Investigaciones Científicas o les càtedres d'universitat que es feien totes per patronatge, diguem, i clientelisme, trencar amb això i portar gent de fora. A més, els hi crees acostuma a ser gent discreta que fa la seva feina i que no veig que parlin molt a fora ni que els diaris o la televisió els hi faci gaire cas i jo crec que això és una bona cosa, potser, no?, perquè ningú tingui gelos i van fent... I, clar, i a més d'hi crear, el Jerem Pendenberg també va guanyar, no fa gaire temps, una d'aquestes coses que a tots els agrada guanyar o ens agradaria guanyar més sovint, que és un IRC gran, no? L'IRC és el European Research Council, i hi ha donatius que fan o donacions o ajuts a la investigació que acostumen a ser de l'ordre de 2 milions d'euros, cosa que et permet tenir 5 anys un bon equip per fer una feina. Això també és una cosa que normalment el sistema hispànic era totalment impensable que això funcionés. I no ve de Madrid, ve de Brussel·les, suposo, en fi, ve dels nostres impostos, no és veritat? Perquè passen per Brussel·les i es dediquen a l'ensenyament i al European Research Council, i ell ara té un d'aquests IRCs advanced grans. I, per tant, té molt a explicar, perquè em sembla que la major part de la recerca que esteu fent és precisament sobre això, sobre política de canvi climàtic. I ell té unes idees molt clares sobre això i no sé si té tindrà prou temps, però millor que ho expliques tu mateix i que després tinguin temps per una discussió, la gent que hi ha a la sala i altra gent que és a fora. A mi em sembla que hem d'acabar en una hora determinada, o no? Sí. Ah, sí, es veu que és una cosa flexible. Molt bé, doncs endavant. Moltes gràcies. És un honor de ser aquí, en aquest edifici tan bonic i parlant sobre un tema tan important. Canviaré a inglès perquè estic més còmode i puc anar una miqueta més precisa i més ràpid, també. És la primera vegada que parlo sobre la política climàtica espanyola, així que estic prenent un risc but I have a strong idea about how climate policy should be ideally designed, and so that is what I want to explain to you. And in the last two weeks, I studied Spanish climate policy in more detail. It's not true that I don't know nothing about it. I even wrote about Spanish climate policy in the newspapers a few times. But, uh, well, it's not easy to get an overview because there are so many little details. Um, and, and so I will talk about policies in Spain, Catalonia, and Barcelona. Uh, because these are three different levels, and it's also interesting to see how the levels uh, complement each other. So if you talk about climate change, you can talk about many things. Uh, you can talk about all the disasters that have already happened, that might happen, how serious the problem is. I don't spend a lot of time on that, because I assume you will already be motivated uh, by the problem. Uh, so I want to speak about the solution. And one way to uh, conceptualize the solution is, as shown in this slide, uh, which shows uh, a graph uh, of the carbon intensity of output, um, let's say, of, of GDP worldwide. And it, so it's an average measure. And this is where we are approximately now. So three quarters of a kilogram of CO2 emissions per uh, dollar of output. It's quite a lot if you think about it. Uh, and we want to be in the future somewhere here, depending on how many people there are in the world and how much income they have. If there are more people and they have a higher average income, then of course we have to reduce emissions more. Uh, 
So in the favorable case, we have to reduce emissions with a factor 20. That means 95% reduction of this intensity factor. In the worst case, a factor 100 improvement, which means more than 90% reduction. That's immense. On a yearly basis, that's more than 4%, maybe even closer to 5% from now on to 2050, which is the goal. Uh, whereas in the past, we've reached 1% at most. So we have to improve what we did in the past with a factor of five. Um, so th these are the challenges. And one conclusion you can draw from that is that uh, we need policies that are extremely effective in reducing emissions. And we can talk about a lot of policies, but most important of all the policies we can discuss are regulatory and pricing policies. All the other policies are extra, and they are important, but they're not crucial. You could do the job with pricing and regulation alone, but you can do it better with additional policies. But without pricing and regulation, you won't get anywhere. That's one message I would like to convey. I'm saying this because I looked at the policies of Spain, uh, for instance, and there are a lot of little details, and they're not very effective. But they add up to a long list, so at first sight you say, wow, impressive, a lot of policies. But it doesn't necessarily add up to something effective. I also want to put my cards on the table. So there are a lot of uh, policies. You could categorize them in four main categories, as I do here. Pricing, in the case of climate, carbon pricing. Uh, effectively, it means CO2 pricing, but you price the carbon in the combustion fuels. And since there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the combusted fuels and the outputs, uh, you effectively tax CO2 by taxing C, carbon. So then we have technical standards, we have adoption subsidies, and we have information provision. And if we want to judge what are the better policies, we have to use criteria. And they're on the horizontal uh, axis. So we have effectiveness, equity, efficiency. And I added one, which is less usual, and that's global harmonization. And I will say more about that. Global harmonization is important because I think it will be impossible to get strong climate policies unless all countries do it simultaneously. Because countries are still afraid, also after the Paris Agreement, to implement very serious policies because they know it can harm their economy and they might be right. Uh, so whether they're right or not, politicians are worried about that. Um, and if, if I now evaluate these different instruments against these criteria and I color positive evaluations with green, negative evaluations in relative sense with red and intermediate evaluations with orange, then you get the picture as you see here. And what is noticeable is that carbon pricing scores relatively good on all the four criteria. Information provision scores good on equity, but not on effectiveness. Um, and the technical standards and adoption subsidies score a bit mixed, negative uh, to very negative. This is relative. It doesn't mean that technical standards don't do anything. But for instance, people overlook often that technical standards, what do they do? They affect the purchases that people do. For instance, we have a technical standard on engines of cars. People buy a car that's more fuel efficient, but you don't control with that instrument the use of that car. What happens often is that people, if they have a more efficient car, that they use it more intensively, especially with electric cars. It has already been documented. People use their car far more often than their old fuel car because they don't have guilt feelings. It looks good, uh, so people start using it more. Um, and, and as a result, uh, the net effect of standards will not be so good as it looks like if you look at an individual effect of a standard on a purchase decision. I could talk more about this, but I, I will explain some of the colors in later slides, so please bear with me. I, you cannot understand everything. You don't have to understand everything based on this uh, slide with a lot of dense information. Yeah. To talk about the international context, uh, we have the Paris Agreement, and many people think that that's the final stage. We have now agreed that we want to solve climate change. Countries have made promises. The problem is that the Paris Agreement is not really an agreement in the traditional sense. It doesn't bind countries to uh, consistent policies. What it did is it collected voluntary pledges, promises by countries, and they, it called that an agreement. And that was kind of a, an emergency solution because after many international negotiations, there was no clear successful story to be told. And uh, in Paris, finally, there was kind of a, a decision made, we have to get out of the room with an agreement. 
It doesn't matter how we call it, it's an agreement. And what you can see is that there are, are in fact four, um, four different categories of promises by countries. There are promises which are very clear, emissions reduction versus a base year in the past. Then there are uh, promises, we will increase our emissions on, if we don't do anything, but we reduce them a little bit versus that increase, but we still increase them. So that's not a real reduction, it's a reduction versus a potential increase in the future. Then China and India, two very important players, of course, in the whole climate game, they have a completely different promise. They promise to reduce the intensity, the carbon intensity of their GDP. But you don't know how that ends then in emissions, because if their GDP will grow a lot, that results in more emissions. Um, and then we have remaining countries like oil-rich countries, oil producers, which didn't make real hard promises. They made very loose promises, for instance, investing in renewable energy without clear emission reduction uh, consequences and, and, and binding targets. So the consequence of these very heterogeneous promises of countries is that we are likely to see in the future that Western countries are going to reduce their emissions, uh, but these emissions are going to move to category two, three, and four countries. And even category two countries that do a lot, and, and maybe even China and India that will do more than other countries, will see their emissions move to even poorer countries. That's really the risk that's very serious. Um, and there is a lot of evidence already that emissions are moving, but we don't even have very strong policies yet. If we manage to have strong policies in some countries, but not in all countries, uh, there will be competitive effects, and along with those, uh, emissions will move to other countries. That can take two forms. Either companies can move or, or move some factories, but it can also just be through the competitive outcome. So uh, some countries will, will lose just some exports to other countries. So you don't necessarily see it in physical terms that com companies move. Um, so uh, we need to fight more to get consistent policies in countries. So the Paris Agreement cannot be the end of the story. We need to try to move the Paris Agreement in the direction of a policy agreement, where countries agree on a similar policy. Otherwise, the, the, the policies can never be strengthened at, at the same level in all the countries. So, uh, first I want to talk to you about what I see as an essential part of the solution, and many economists, but I think it's a more complicated issue than many people realize, carbon pricing. There are four classical arguments in favor of this instrument. Uh, the idea is that you change the relative prices of high and low carbon goods and services and therefore make the low carbon uh, alternatives more attractive. Uh, also, the idea is that with uh, any pricing instrument in environmental policy, you reduce costs because you select the cheapest options. Uh, and, and since there's a lot of heterogeneity of options and, and different cost curves, that's an important objective, also as climate change will be expensive. Pricing also means decentralization. Governments don't have to know all the technologies and costs. They just decentralize the decisions of what is the, the best solution at, at a ma micro level to, to households, investors, uh, firms, innovators. And then there is a permanent incentive if there is a cost uh, created uh, for technology adoption and innovation. So not only will you reduce emissions with all your direct opportunities, but you will change your opportunities in technological sense. This is a graph, I'm not going to do all in detail, but just to show you, it's a classic graph of environmental economics, uh, which shows that if you have uh, curves uh, and options that are, sorry, that are, very, that are very different for two polluters, then a uniform standard leads to different costs for the, for the two companies and it's not the best solution. If you let the one with the highest cost reduce emissions more and the one with the lower cost reduce emissions more, you can get the same outcome, eh, as in this equation shown, as when you have uniform. Yeah, you can see it here, but, not on, but it, it, it doesn't show on the, on the screen now. That's a pity. Um, maybe, no, I don't have a cursor either. I cannot do it. In any case, um, uh, the best, the, it's impossible for a government to know these heterogeneous standards. And the best that they can do is charge a price. 
here with the abstract letter lambda, not so attractive, but in any case, then the firms will go sit at these points which are consistent with heterogeneous standards. And that is the basic idea of both decentralization and cost minimization, a very important, powerful result. And many non-economists are not charmed by this finding because, well, cost minimization, efficiency, they, they don't get warm from that. But I think it's extremely important because we might convince politicians and voters to implement good, strong policies. But if it then turns out that there are serious costs, then maybe political support will be withdrawn along the transition uh, trajectory. So it is extremely important to search for low-cost solutions always, I think, because uh, expensive solutions will be more difficult to, to maintain in terms of stable political support. So this is the classic story. But I think that classic story has not convinced a wide audience of non-economists, voters, journalists, non-economists. And, and we should, as economists, talk more about this and explain the importance of carbon pricing in different ways. And so I have here eight more arguments. I don't have the time to go into all the details. But one thing is that if you price a pollutant, uh, like, like uh, fossil fuels, then throughout the economy, all the prices will adapt to that input price, to the new input price. And that means that nothing, no decision in the economy, escapes the influence of this policy. And that's different with the standard. If you have a standard on a technology, only the purchase decision will be influenced, but nothing else. But if you have a price on carbon, even the purchase decision will be influenced, because the car is produced with carbon emissions as well. So the car will become more expensive. And then choices, will go in the direction of lower, lower cost options, and by definition, these will also be lower carbon uh, emissions options. So we need to make sure that cheap is low carbon, basically. Um, well, most emissions are also coming out of market decisions, and that means it's important to, to affect these market decisions, and, and prices can do that. Um, I also think the fifth point, international policy harmonization will be much more easy with pricing than with other instruments. If you have thousands of technical standards for many different technologies, it's more difficult to harmonize. Moreover, countries have very different interests in technologies. Take, for instance, car technologies. Germany has an important industry in cars, and these are expensive cars with relatively a lot of emissions. Eh? BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, Audi. So Germany will not be inclined to have strong technical standards on, on cars. And in fact, if you look at the history of negotiations in that area, you see that Germany always resists a little bit, for good reasons. Um, if you have a pricing policy, it's not so obvious. Pricing will affect everything. It, it won't affect one technology specifically, and therefore uh, maybe can move away from this uh, lobbying and resistance against technology-specific um, policies. Also, a pricing policy could be started internationally very easy. You could say, let's first agree in principle about a uniform carbon price. And then, ju just the idea of a uniform carbon price, but we keep it at level zero. Then we put it at level one or 10. And then we go up and we try to convince everybody to stay on board. Then we have revenues. We can use the revenues to compensate the countries that have more trouble to deal with that price and so on. So I think that instrument is very simple, it's simple to communicate, it's clear and you might negotiate it easier. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and we have to do it to show it, but uh, the Paris negotiations or the pre-Paris negotiations have never seriously tried this. What's also forgotten is that if we uh, price oil uh, very much, then we reduce the margin for the producers of oil, the, the companies and, and the OPEC countries, to gain profit. So, so in a way, you make sure that the revenues that now, in a, to a large extent, go to OPEC countries, to oil shakes, they stay within our countries, and we can use them for a better purpose. Because now many of these oil shakes, they don't know what to do with their money, they give that money to football players. Huh? All the football clubs, rich football clubs in the world, they get a lot of subsidies from oil money, are owned more and more by oil uh, shakes nowadays. I also think, and it's a final point I want to make, it's not all the points, but the eighth point, Pricing spreads the pain. 
So not only does it select the cheap options, but it also makes sure that we will use all the options to reduce emissions, non-excluded. And that means that the transition will be as smooth as possible. It may still be difficult, but it will be smoother than when we say, let's do only a few important sectors. An important note, intermezzo a little bit, but I think it's important. Uh, I noticed that sometimes students don't realize exactly what's the difference between a carbon tax or a carbon price and a traditional fuel or energy tax. Uh, and the difference is that a carbon tax is proportional to carbon emissions in the fuel. So if you have a fuel with more carbon emissions per unit of energy, the price will be higher. Um, and what we should do, in fact, and what Spain also should do, is convert all the existing fuel and energy taxes into genuine carbon taxes. It's not so easy, difficult, because these taxes exist already. If you convert them, they still will generate revenues, but they will more precisely give an incentive to reduce CO2 emissions than they do now. So, for instance, now you have a tax on gasoline and on, on diesel, but the difference between these taxes is not based on carbon content. It's based on historical reasons, and, uh, and in other countries, the differences are, are, are larger, for instance, or, or smaller, but, but there's no good basis for that. We need to re-evaluate all these existing taxes on energy and fuels from a carbon perspective. I think this is extremely important, and it's not so difficult. So that would be my first concrete advice to the Spanish government to do. Um, I'm not going to read this slide, but I just want to say there's a lot of evidence for the effectiveness of carbon pricing. Although it's an instrument that has been applied only relatively recently, there are now several studies that, based on good statistics and econometrics, show it has an effect. It has a small effect because the prices have been small, but it has a significant effect. And, and this is just for those people who are a bit skeptical, say it's a theoretical idea. No, it's also empirically supported already. And then some people question whether we can achieve deep decarbonization, 99% emissions reduction, which we need. Um, and I understand why people have questions about that, but I would also like to say, if with carbon pricing you affect the decisions of all consumers, producers, investors, innovators, nobody exempted, then it means the things are gonna change, because if you already affect many consumers in their behavior, then the consumers will also see, hey, a lot of others have changed their behavior, I can also change my behavior. Many people buy an electric car, let me do it as well. So you get also a social process of change. Um, and in, a, in effect, carbon pricing is a systemic instrument, which we need for a systemic problem like climate change. Also, you have to realize if you raise a price, like carbon, uh, carbon price, then at cer certain moment, you get a domino effect. A lot of things will change. And you create a social tipping point. We don't know where that tipping point will be, but there will be a tipping point. With a certain carbon price, a lot of changes will be generated. And of course, uh, it's important to note also that the, the climate policy will have to be broader than carbon pricing, and that will help also deep decarbonization. I want to also make a clear statement that some people will disagree with. Uh, I see Jordi Roca in the room, and we've had many discussions about this in the past. What is better, carbon taxation or carbon markets? I used to be rather indifferent. I used to say, well, it depends. We can have both. But I'm more and more positive about carbon markets. And that has an empirical reason. And that's the European ETS, Emissions Trading System. This is a market that covers 31 countries, all the EU countries, the 28, and a few countries more, Liechtenstein, uh, Norway, I'm not sure which is the third, a small country probably, Switzerland maybe. Um, and that price is now around 60 euros per ton, and it's making a real difference. Even the Spanish electricity is relatively expensive, partly, maybe 20% of its higher price is due to this effect. People don't like that, but yeah, that is the consequence of a joint climate policy through the EU. We have to respect that. So I think carbon markets are the future for two reasons. They can integrate many countries easily, and they are away from daily politics. 
you don't hear any country, not even Spain with its high electricity prices currently, to say, let's get rid of the ETS, let's step out of ETS. They don't say that. Everybody has embraced ETS, and ETS is an institution that's independent from the, the, the waves in daily politics, eh? the moods in daily politics. With carbon taxation, it's, it's going to be a different situation. You have a carbon tax implemented, comes a new government, they might decide to, to lower it or to remove it. But if you have an international agreement already on an ETS, it will be much more difficult to touch that. Um, and for instance, some of the right-wing parties at the level of, of Spain, they don't talk a lot of, uh, about climate. I think they have the strategy, we don't deny climate change, but we don't mention it. That's the best strategy because we cannot say much about it. But I, I think that especially the Partido Popular is not quickly also going to say step out of the European trading system, the ETS. I, I don't, it would surprise me at least. Uh, and that's a, that's a positive thing and we have to learn from that. Well, there's more to say about why carbon markets are good. They can respond very flexibly to changes in the economy, to new technologies. So you don't have to update the price. The price will respond to the scarcity in the market. And that's good. New fashions, new technologies, uh, the market price will, will respond. Uh, despite all these advantages which I've mentioned, there's still quite some resistance against carbon pricing, uh, both in science and, and in society. Uh, and I understand that, uh, because for many people, carbon pricing is an abstract idea, it's economics, it's more market. Mm, they don't like that, for either ideological reasons often. Um, there's also the idea that pricing immediately creates inequalities, uh, and I will say something about that. I'm, I'm a bit critical of people who, who are resisting carbon pricing because they don't come up with a good alternative. It's fine to be critical, uh, and you should be critical for the good reasons, but apart from that, you should have an alternative that is working as well, and I don't think they have. What I see uh, from, from especially sociologists, political scientists, geographers, is that they come with ideas that go very much in the direction of local action, voluntary action, bottom-up, spontaneous bottom-up action. Well, we, we have talked about these options since the 1960s, and they don't make a difference. It doesn't mean that we need them, but I think we need to trigger these actions with policies, with regulation, top-down. So I, I'm not here to deny the importance of bottom-up. At the end of the day, everything we do is bottom-up, but we need to regulate, we need to stimulate the bottom-up. Uh, another group of critics uh, comes with the idea of industrial policy especially a book by Colin Ward and Victor has received a lot of attention in this respect. I, I think it's risky because they come with an, an option that lacks good theory and good evidence. Also, industrial policy is difficult in the current constellation uh, of many countries because uh, we, we quickly run into entry trust legislation problems there. Uh, if one country in Europe uh, undertakes industrial policy, the EU will critically look upon it. And it's not easy to sell it like a neutral policy uh, to the EU level. And it will be very difficult also to do it at the EU level, as I said already, because different countries have different interests, because sector structures are very different. Some countries have a car industry, others don't. Others have very strong chemical industries, others don't. Others have aluminium <coughs> industry, others have um, uh, cement industry. The countries are quite different if you look at them. And, and so the interest will be different, the lobbying will be different. So I don't believe that it's going to go very far. But more importantly, I think industrial policy will not be systemic policy. It's as if only the companies matter. No, everything matters. The households matter a lot too. Uh, transport matters a lot too. Uh, so there's a lot to do, and I don't think we, will, we can do that with industrial policy. So it, it will be difficult to harmonize among countries, and as a result also you should expect a lot of leakage between countries. So here I summarize uh, the arguments, pro and contra, um, and in my view, and I've written a paper on this with colleagues, the, the pro arguments weigh heavier than the contra arguments. So one specific argument that people raise quickly against carbon pricing is that it's inequitable. And maybe that's because the initial proposals were 
standalone proposals, meaning they spoke about how to design a carbon market, how to design a carbon tax, but they didn't speak a lot about how to use the revenues. And if you don't do that, then you don't have a good complement for dealing with inequity effects, because it is true that any serious regulatory cr climate policy, including carbon pricing, will make products more expensive, uh, including basic goods. So, so poor households, uh, the popular term that's now days used is energy poor households, will be affected, and you need to compensate them. And you can do that with the revenues. Carbon markets, through the sales of, uh, of, of permits, generate revenues. Carbon taxes generate revenues, evidently, too. So you, you can compensate. And the nice thing is that you can um, make this an automatic policy. You can say, we use a part of the revenues to compensate poor households. Uh, people should also realize that other policies have inequitable effects. People often don't realize that. For instance, subsidies are very popular, but they have inequitable effects. For instance, all the subsidies on electric vehicles and solar PV on rooftops, they go to well-off households. They don't go, go to poor households. Poor households are not the first to buy an electric vehicle, and they don't have a house often to put solar PV on. But nobody complains about that. Um, so I, I think also at the international level, if we focus the Paris Agreement more on carbon pricing, then we can also generate revenues automatically and solve another serious problem of the Paris Agreement, which is the Green Climate Fund or the, the climate finance. In Paris, it was agreed that all the rich countries would generate a huge fund of hundreds of millions for the poor countries, and they still haven't done it. If you make that automatic through a carbon price, it's away from politics. It's a one-time decision, but then it's not touched anymore. If it is something you have to ask the countries each year, it's more difficult. So there's now a lot known about how to use the carbon pricing revenues. There's a lot of experiences in different countries. To the left, you can see a graph for uh, different regions and countries, Alberta and Canada, Australia, British Columbia in, in Canada, Norway, Switzerland. Uh, and to the right, you see arguments, what you should do given the political problems and challenges. So in general, there's not one receipt. It's not that we use, should use the revenues always in the same way. It depends a little bit. What is the political debate? You have to make sure that you use the revenues to get sufficient political support. There's one paradox I found in studies with my own team, and that's if you ask people what they are concerned about, then they express... Uh, the uneven burden of climate policy. So they worry about energy poor households. But if you then ask people, how would you spend the revenues from carbon taxes or carbon markets, then they always mention uh, very much climate projects, public climate projects. That's what people like. And we have the feeling that it has to do with the fact that people don't understand the basic characteristic of carbon pricing or environmental pricing, namely that that instrument is not meant to generate revenues, it is meant to regulate behavior, to change behavior. And, uh, of course, any pricing generates revenue. So next to the main effect, the regulatory effect, you have also a financing or a revenue-raising effect. But many people think that the main purpose of carbon pricing is to generate revenues and to invest those revenues in projects, and those projects solve climate change. But that's not the idea. In principle, you don't need to undertake projects, but really many people think governments should invest in renewable energy. Governments generally don't invest in renewable energy because it's too costly. The taxes will not be sufficient. Renewable energy projects, big windmill parks are so expensive, you need private partners. Maybe Barcelona has one windmill or can have a little bit of solar PV on the rooftops of its buildings, but that won't make a big difference. That's not gonna make the big difference. But many people don't, don't see that, so we have to explain this also better. And therefore, we have to invest more in education information provision, because to get political support for this complex story, uh, people need to be informed. I already spoke a little bit about this idea that if we change the behavior of people with regulation, with standards or with uh, pricing, some subset of the population will show a different behavior, and they can show an example for the rest of the population. So people can imitate, and people are sensitive to that. With new technologies, you always have first movers and late movers. Eh? Late adopters, I should say. First adopters, late adopters. Um, and we have to expect that also for low carbon uh, uh, technologies. Uh, 
electric vehicles, some people buy them early on, others come very late. But if many people use an electric vehicle, then these latecomers will at, at a certain moment also speed up. So we did a study with uh, some people in my team and we, well, we made a mathematical model where we combined traditional economics with network structures to, to, to model the social imitation behavior. And we found that uh, the carbon taxes become much more effective. So we need a lower carbon tax, and that's basically what the figure shows, but it, it, these curves can be interpreted as the effectiveness. So you go up the curve, if there's more social influence eh, on the horizontal axis, you go up the curve, and that means your tax becomes more effective. You create more emissions reduction. And what's also interesting, this provides then also a connection with other policies, information provision and network policies. So if we then can make the networks more effective, then the policy can even become more effective in emissions reduction. And you see here, for instance, four different networks, regular networks, small world networks, random networks and scale-free networks. Well, these different networks have different structures, for instance, where everybody's connected to neighbors, or where a few people have a lot of followers, and many people have few followers, uh, like an in internet. Uh, uh, or you have situations where there are sub-networks. And, and depending on the product, you can look which network is the most important, then you can identify a little bit what, what is the situation. But you could also try to convert networks that are not so effective in more effective networks. Uh, by uh, providing comparative information, by social marketing, by giving awards for good behavior. Um, and that will affect, you will either move the gamma, the social influence, the basic strength of social influence to the right, or you will change the network structure, go to a different color curve in a way. So that, that's an interesting finding. Then the practice of carbon pricing, there are many countries, many regions, in North America, in Europe, uh, even other parts of the world that uh, experiment with carbon pricing, but carbon prices are low. And that has to do with this lack of international harmonization. Um, and and the, you have to realize that climate change is a public good. As an economist, I don't have to explain economists what a public good is, but it means you cannot be exempted from the consequences, but your contribution is also always very small and you're not very motivated to contribute a lot. Um, and that holds for the solution to climate change at the individual level or at the country level. Even a country like China, contributing 30% of emissions on a yearly basis now. If China would reduce its emissions to zero, we would have 30% less emissions. It's not enough. You will notice it, but it's not a big difference so even China is not willing to do that on its own because the cost of China to reduce those emissions to zero will be immense and the benefits less climate change will be very small. The benefits of less climate change will only be large if we go very close to 99% of emissions reduction. That's the problem. So to get there, we have to convince everybody. A little bit is not enough. A lot is necessary. What we found is if we looked at all the carbon prices, this is another study I did with a student, so these are the 31 most important carbon pricing initiatives in the world, both markets and taxes. And you see uh, three colors. You see gray, you see uh, pink, and you see purple. Purple means uh, countries where both a carbon tax and a carbon market are at stake. And that is the EU ETS, because some countries have a carbon tax ne next to the carbon market there. Um, the pink countries have only a carbon a market or only a carbon tax. And the gray is something which we calculated. We calculated the difference between the advertised prices and the real average price. And for instance, the country most famous for having a high carbon price is Sweden, here in third place. The gray uh, curve goes up to almost 130. That's a very high carbon price, actually. But that carbon price is not really uh, uh, representative for what they do, because they immediately have exemptions, they have lower prices. So this is advertised because this price is applied in some places, but in few places. And what you see is that on average, Sweden is not in first place, Sweden is in a third place. Norway and, then, and, and, and Switzerland are before uh, Sweden. You see here also Spain. Uh, Spain is in a middle position. 
In Spain, it's a smaller gap, but it has a low uh, carbon price. Well, interestingly, the carbon prices, on average carbon prices, are also different for all the countries that have an ETS price. Why? Because they have different uh, energy and sectoral structure. So a country with a lot of energy use, because it has a heavy industry, will be more affected by the carbon price. Than, and that's why you get also differential average prices, even though the basic ETS price is the same for all these countries. Yeah? And now we did one step further. We also looked at implicit prices, because what I was talking about now is the explicit carbon price through uh, uh, carbon markets and carbon taxes. But many countries have fuel prices and energy prices, and they could be converted to carbon prices. So we did that as well. And then the picture changes completely. For instance, Sweden now goes to a middle position. Look here. And the reason is probably that Sweden substituted its fuel prices for carbon prices. So it looked like Sweden did a big investment in climate policy, but it just substituted their existing energy taxes for uh, carbon prices. Because you can see, Sweden has relatively little other fuel prices compared to other countries. But you see here now that Switzerland is in, on top. Iceland, Luxembourg has a high taxes. And uh, well, you, you see now, where is Spain here? Spain is even next, is above Sweden now. Well, there's a very small difference. Because Spain has relatively high uh, fuel and energy taxes. But as I said, these, this blue part is implicit prices. And they don't incentivize emissions reduction well. So the trick is now to make them green, and then you immediately are more effective in reducing your emissions. Um, so this is what the green says, uh, the green text. Uh, Transform your implicit into explicit carbon taxes. That's an advice to all countries, including Spain. So my final slide about the general part is about broader policy package. So I've talked a lot, spoken a lot about carbon pricing, but I'm also convinced that we need more. As I said already about the social uh, imitation, we need network policies and, and, and social information policies. And that's what the first point says, to stimulate public support in, generally for, in general for, public, for policies, to stimulate behavioral change in a wider sense and to benefit from the social multiplier effect of regulation. We need information provision, we need nudges. And nudges, I don't know if you know the term, a popular term in behavioral science nowadays, means physical and behavioral um, changes in, in people's environment to make sure that their bounded rationality is directed in the right way for public uh, outcomes, or is even corrected. Uh, so, for instance, you use default values to make sure, so if you, you sell car, you provide car information, you, you try to sell electric cars before you, you sell uh, fuel-based uh, cars. I also have to be honest if, to say that if you have only carbon pricing, there's one serious problem you have to deal with, namely innovation. Because if you have a carbon price and a serious carbon price, then a lot of potentially promising technological trajectories will be closed because they are too expensive. Maybe they need still a lot of innovation. So you need to subsidize technologies that you have a lot of trust in that they will be important in the future. Because a carbon price will select cheap options right now. So anything that's not cheap will be dead. And that's why you need innovation subsidies. I've spoken a bit critical about technical standards so far, but I believe they can complement carbon pricing. So I'm absolutely in favor of limiting car power, having smaller cars, also because it's safer in accidents. If you have a heavy car, there's more energy to be distributed in an accident, so more health effects. So I'm, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of limits on car power, car acceleration speed, etc. Uh, but these, uh, I repeat, these affect purchase decisions, not use decisions. For use decisions, you need carbon pricing. And we need other policies for other emission so sources like deforestation and landfills. And a final uh, comment on, on, in general is that we also have to think about how instruments in policy interact, and there's still, there's a lot known now about that. So this graph shows that you can have positive and negative synergy, or even backfire. So if you have multiple instruments, or, or in this case two instruments, um, if you have no synergy, then the sum of the pure effects, when the instruments are used in isolation, adds up to the 
combined effect. But if you have a positive synergy, you get a better result. If you have negative synergy, you get a worse result. If you have a very negative synergy, you get even a, a worse result than one of the instruments on its own. So you should never do that. And we know examples, for instance, um, this is a famous example. If you have a renewable energy targets and a carbon market, they interfere because the energy targets select very expensive options in electricity production. And if they count in the, in the carbon market, then they push away cheap options there. So, and since you are in a carbon market, you have a ceiling to emissions, you will never realize more emissions reduction with that. You just substitute cheap su options for emissions reduction by expensive ones. This has happened. This has happened in the EU. It's still happening. This has happened in the US. There's even policies at state level in the US, in California, that are frustrating national level policies with all good intentions. Economists are publishing now about it. And, and that's very important to understand uh, because otherwise we're doing things with good intentions that are ineffective or, or even have a negative effect. So finally, I, I arrive at the climate policy of Spain. And I want to make this provision again that I'm not an expert. I, uh, it's difficult to be an expert because it's also difficult to understand all the ins and outs, but I think I got the, the big picture, so I, I want to talk about that. Um, so, as, as you all are aware of, probably uh, the most important uh, decision was made this year, in May, uh, when the Parliament uh, voted in favour of a climate change and energy transition law. And the aim of this law is to reduce emissions with 23% by 2030 versus emissions in 1990. Uh, Greenpeace was very critical of this because the EU target is much higher, it's 55%. Uh, also, Spain in 2050 has the aim of zero emissions. So that's a big jump from 23% to zero in 2050. But, well, uh, if you look at the policies, they comprise mainly encouraging or soft measures, trying to stimulate people but not forcing people to change or targets without clear policies. I have here some examples. So we have here electric vehicle charging stations are required in petrol stations. That's nice, but that's not really triggering people uh, in itself. It's maybe a necessary condition for people to buy more electric cars, but it's not a sufficient condition. Urban renewal and low emission zones. Uh, Barcelona has several low emission zones, but this is really in downtown in the center if you go to Barcelona by car, you see a lot of cars everywhere. So there's only a small portion of low emission that's not really making a big, big difference. It's also difficult for Barcelona because Barcelona depends a lot on cars. There's a lot of car garages in the center that have to also make money. So there's a lot of interest and in, in lobbying also there. There's, uh, regarding companies, uh, a requirement that corporate, uh, well, corporate institutions, uh, companies have to uh, develop climate action plans and they have to also publish their carbon footprint. I, I'm not very convinced that this way will make a big difference, but it will create a lot of work for experts to publish these reports in any case. There's references to low carbon diets without clear policies. And also it's not clear what this will contribute. Uh, there's renewable energy targets here, like in many countries, 74% in 2030, which is extremely ambitious. I don't know exactly where Spain is now, 20%, 25%, I think. Uh, the problem is with all these policies, there is no good empirical evidence that these are going to be very effective. So I am wondering also who has advised the government to do this. Um, and I'll come back to that later. So regarding regulatory and pricing instruments, the main policy here is that Spain participates in the European ETS, the Emissions Trading System, the European Carbon Market. But Spain lacks additional taxes as many other countries have. There is an OECD report which says that Spain has a carbon tax. Very much confusion. People have asked me many times, what is this carbon tax? Uh, there is confusion about it. I think someone at the OECD thought that some fuel tax was a carbon tax. There was, was supposedly also a sp very specific tax on chemicals, which was once called a carbon tax. And I've looked and I haven't found it. It can't be high either, because it, it no, doesn't appear anywhere. If anybody knows more about it, I'm interested. Maybe the, it's in Spanish language uh, documents that I didn't find. Uh, Spain also has bans. 
and bans are of course the most strictest form of regulation, eh? you forbid something, but these bans are in the future. So for instance, it has a ban on hydrocarbon operations in the Spanish territory, but this is in 2042. No, sorry, sorry, I'm making a mistake here. No, they have a ban on, maybe it's not a good word, they, have, they forbid new permits for hydrocarbon operations, so new investments right now. So that's, that's an immediate ban. But then they have a ban on fossil fuel production after 2042. And they have a ban on new combustion engines in cars after 2040. That's late. Imagine that many fossil fuel cars have a lifetime of 15 years. So that means that after 2050, a lot of fossil fuel cars will drive around. That's a bit odd if your objective is zero emissions in 2050. So I guess I would have said 2035 there, which is also more in line with other countries. But probably there were lobbying efforts there and, and, and that can explain this. Um, these, non, these shock policies are not so wise. I think it's better, it's nice to have these bans, but what is more important is to reduce car use and car ownership and shift to low carbon cars earlier on. That, that's really the most important policy. And there's no clear policies in this respect, uh, except a subsidy policy, and I will get to that. What is interesting, I mentioned it already, is that electricity prices are currently very high for various reasons. The two most important reasons that have been mentioned in the media are high gas prices internationally because of scarcity, having to do with COVID and quick recovery of industry in many countries, uh, and EU ETS prices. I've also heard the story that it might have to do that Spain is less capable than other countries to import cheap electricity from France and other countries because the electricity connections infrastructure is of insufficient capacity. Um, I can't verify this, but uh, I can imagine there is another reason because Spain has higher prices relatively than many other countries in Europe. So there is some extra reason, it seems. I don't understand uh, completely the, the government policy in this respect because the government has reduced temporarily the VAT, uh, the value added tax, uh, and, and removed a tax on electricity generation costs, a 7% tax. Um, and from an economic perspective, I would say that has two dangers. First of all, it coordinates all the electricity suppliers. We're going to lower the price, the, t the tax, so that creates immediately an opportunity for all the suppliers to compensate by a higher price because they know it applies to the whole market. So you can coordinate the market almost with that decision. The other thing is that if you remove a tax, you always create an additional margin for, for profit, and the, and the companies know that. So if you want to compensate a price increase because of equity reasons, eh, that was the reason in this case, they were worried that poor energy, energy poor households couldn't pay the bills, it's not wise to do it through an instrument that directly affects the price. It's better to do it through something that's independent of the price, like income tax taxes. And I also think that would have been better because now they try to keep the price lower, which I think didn't, ha didn't succeed. But if it would have succeeded, it would have lowered the price for everyone, for high incomes equally. Well, uh, what's wrong? It's good from, from a climate perspective. It's quite good that the electricity prices are high. Maybe not for social reasons, but benefit also from this. Try to use the opportunity also, I think. No, I didn't, don't see any discussion in this respect. It was a very defensive discussion. And, and so I think it would have been more effective, cheaper, equitable, and with no interference with the electricity price if they have reduced income taxes only for low house, income households. But this 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 opportunity has already passed now. Well, more about climate policy pain. Buildings, uh, like in all countries, there are energy efficiency goals with good intentions. Usually, these don't have much effect because, what, first of all, people don't comply with them. There's even subsidies in many countries to invest in your house, to, re to refurbish your house, to make it more energy efficient. But these subsidies are not used very much. They're not very popular, uh, strangely enough. Because maybe because decisions to, to make big changes in our house are not easy for people to make. So maybe it's better to force people or to have companies that come by and advise you and say this, but to leave it to the people themselves, I don't think it's a good, good way to do policy. Also, in many other countries, Germany and the Netherlands now, they're thinking about an, your, uh, 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 carbon 
ETS and emissions trading for uh, the building sector to make sure really that there's no rebound effects also. And the Europe, European Commission has now also decided that this is the future. In fact, they also have an ETS planned for uh, transport because there's the same thing happening. You have a lot of norms and standards, but there's rebound and they feel we need to put a ceiling for these sectors to make sure that the emissions are hard, under hard control. So I think Spain could also do something in this direction. With regard to transport, uh, the main policy, as I understand it, seems to be uh, subsidizing electric vehicles. And uh, the COVID recovery funds from the EU are a welcome uh, revenue now for the Spanish government to do that. So I'm critical of that for several reasons. First of all, I think many economists are also of this opinion, subsidies are risky always. Because subsidies try to convince people of something they either don't want to do and they don't do it, or they had already decided to do it, and then there's a windfall profit. And there's a lot of examples of this. You can also car price carbon, and then you make the dirty thing more expensive, and you create a gap between the clean and the dirty. But to do it with a subsidy, it's, it's just more expensive. Uh, uh, and, and, and also, we know that the, the marginal costs of emissions reduction is usually much higher through subsidies than through carbon pricing. So, for instance, many subsidies are given for, to electric vehicles have a marginal cost of 1,000 euro per ton of CO2 for effective emissions reduction. That's not attractive. And people complain about a carbon price of Europe, which is 60. Well, why don't we go for that route? But, well, uh, subsidies are popular because there's less resistance against them from everyone. There's also another fundamental problem that, that's not discussed very well, that if we go large scale through subsidies in electric vehicles, what will happen then is that these vehicles will lose elect use electricity that's still quite dirty. If Spanish renewables are only 20% of total electricity production on average, that means 80% is dirty. And you don't, should not expect that everybody who buys an uh, electric vehicle will make sure that the electricity of to, to fuel that car comes from renew renewable sources. That's even impossible, probably. But in some ca cases, but it will make it more expensive driving an electric car. Uh, so what we should do, really, is plan the extension of renewable energy before the extension of electric vehicles to make the policies more effective. But, but uh, few governments talk about this, actually. Uh, it's a bit a neglected topic uh, of attention, I have the feeling. We should also be realistic, the life cycle emissions of electric vehicles are not so good still, uh, and there's a lot of debate on this, uh, and I'm not optimistic. I think there's a lot forgotten in the whole uh, life cycle. It's very difficult to know for sure what's happening there. If you have a carbon price, you control the life cycle also. You, you will also make sure that batteries that have a better performance in emissions, carbon emissions, are selected over other batteries. Now we don't have these incentives. Okay, so. In my view, summary, summarizing, the whole law shows little appreciation for having a lot of emissions coverage, for effective instruments, for indirect life cycle emissions, for rebound, and for leakage. And therefore, I, I'm not optimistic. I don't think this law is going to reduce emissions a lot or at all. A final comment is that the law mentions an advisory committee of experts, and I said already, I'm curious who advised the government. And the law is half a year old now, and there's, as far as I know, I couldn't find on internet any information about this committee. And I would say, if you have this law, install a committee so that you have all the expertise. And there's a lot of expertise in Spain. Use it. You know? So, uh, climate policy of Catalonia, am I still on time or am I... Yeah? We can have a few more slides? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So, climate policy of Catalonia is less rich for understandable reasons, uh, and that's in one of the slides, because Catalonia doesn't have so much freedom in climate policy. Uh, but uh, it has a Catalan law, Catalan law on climate change, and this says that emissions have to be reduced by 40% by 2030, higher than Spain. Uh, that's typical of Catalonia, of course. Um, and it has also a plan 65% by 2040, 100% 2050. So there is a plan over time. Um, there's no shortage of nice language, but again, it's difficult to match it with good policies. And I think the main policy that Catalonia recently put in place uh, 
is CO2 tax on cars. Uh, and this is in fact not really a CO2 tax, it's a quasi CO2 tax, because it's not a CO2 tax on fuels, it's a CO2 tax on engines. It, it punishes cars which have a heavy engine or an old engine, which generates a lot of emissions per unit of, of, uh, of, of uh, fuel, let's say. And so the tax is unrelated to how many kilometers people drive or which fuels they use. That's not really a good idea. It's a very distinct idea from the notion of a carbon tax. That's why I'm not really happy they called it a CO2 tax. And that's why I would like that everybody who talks about this calls it a quasi-CO2 tax, because it's very different. And it may even give a bad name later to CO2 tax, because uh, my, my fear is not, it's not going to work. In fact, I understand that the idea of the tax is to di discourage people to have heavy cars and pollutive cars. And that's a good idea. But I think it would have been better to do that uh, as a purchase tax, when people buy a new car, uh, because that's the moment people make decisions in this respect. With this tax, people are not going to change. Uh, people who, who are willing to buy a car of 50,000 euros with a big engine, they're not going to be discouraged by a tax of 50 euros per year. Moreover, this is effectively also an addition to the existing uh, annual cir circulation tax. And, and these taxes already uh, differentiate between heavier and, and lighter cars. So there is already an element of punishing more pollutive cars, and it's just made stronger now. But I think uh, it would be better to have a, yeah, a purchase tax that's also higher, that's a more significant price, percentage of the price. Because if you, if you have a, a tax of 30 euros on a car, in terms of purchase, that, that, that has no effect. You have to have at least uh, something like 5, 10% of the value of a car. So it should run in the thousands of euros, I think, for it to make a difference, really. But, yeah, that hasn't happened. But uh, maybe the explanation for this, this uh, tax is that the Catalan government was uh, held back by the Constitutional Court of Spain when it wanted to implement more measures. And uh, the court said that Can Catalonia cannot enforce uh, emissions reduction targets. Maybe it can mention emission reduction targets as targets, but it cannot enforce them. I don't know if, if uh, someone has brought this tax already to court. I can imagine maybe there's going to be a decision by the Constitutional Court also on this uh, tax. I would be interested to hear that. But I, I think it's more important that Spain takes up this regulatory role because there's also a risk if one region does a lot and other regions don't, that you get trans-border effects or you get leakage. Uh, we know also that uh, people... Uh, already sometimes move to other regions or countries to, 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 tax, to, to go for gasoline, which is cheaper. In fact, I was born at the border of the Netherlands and Belgium. And my father sometimes went to Belgium to buy gasoline when it was cheaper. That happened. People would even buy cars in Belgium and kept the, the license plate in Belgium as the Belgium license plate while driving around in the Netherlands because it was simply cheaper. You have to count in your policies for these things. So that's why it's even good that in the EU we coordinate these transport policies. And also Spain has one good transport-oriented policy, I think. I think Catalonia is honestly too small for this, with all its good intentions. And then we go to an even smaller, lower level, which is Barcelona. Barcelona is relevant, of course, because Barcelona is relatively large compared to the rest of Catalonia. Eh? If you take various economic indicators, Catal half of Catalonia or 70% of Catalonia is happening in Barcelona. And um, Barcelona has another uh, goal. It's interesting. All the different levels have diff of, of governance have different goals. So they have 45% emissions reduction in 2030. And I, I looked at the important actions of, uh, of Barcelona, and I aggregated them in 10 categories, and I gave them a color to give a, a quicker picture of what's happening. So the, the blue color indicates what is mitigation, emissions reduction. The green is adaptation, and the, the other are not really one of the two, but are more social policies. So, in effect, Barcelona doesn't have much of emissions reduction. That's understandable, because I think cities are probably more focused and apt to do uh, uh, adaptation. So, Barcelona has low emission traffic zones, more parking regulations to, to create uh, emissions reduction. Uh, 
It also has uh, a, a project for energy rehabilitation of buildings. It has the idea of solar energy in the city. Uh, and also there's uh, ideas to, to uh, prevent residues, uh, waste, to mitigate climate change. I think these are all good ideas, but they're not very effective instruments, but it is maybe what is possible in the realm of, of the governance of, of uh, Barcelona. Of course, if I think of Barcelona and also of Spain, maybe coming from the Netherlands, which is a, a bicycle country, I see a lot of cars. And I think, especially for the cities, the challenge is to reduce the amount of cars, and that's difficult. Barcelona is, in fact, now often in the list of more sustainable cities in the world. And that's fine, and, and that's sympathetic, and I applaud that. But at the same time, when I'm in Barcelona, I see a lot of cars always. And I think you have to reduce the number of cars. It's difficult, I think, because there's already a lot invested in infrastructure, in garages, parkings, etc. And also with the warm climate and the hilly topography, it's difficult to get rid of cars. It's, it really creates an, an, an effort. Biking on your own is something that if you have small children, you have to bring them from here to there. It's not easy, I understand that. Uh, and not everybody has grown up with public transport. Uh, so it, it, I think there's a real challenge here to get a really low carbon city for Barcelona. What I think is important, and maybe that has been realized a little bit in Barcelona, that ownership of cars needs to be discouraged. Because once people have a car, they get addicted to it. And if young people have a car, uh, then they, they are set for life. Um, and I see that I live in a neighborhood uh, in, in San Kirse, close to Bellaterra, where the university is uh, autonomous. And in my neighborhood, young people quickly have a car. My daughter just got her driving license, but she doesn't get a car. She can use sometimes a car, but she is using public transport, and that's good. Uh, but a girlfriend of hers, 18, got a car from the parents. And yeah, these people will never go to public transport. And how, how to do something about it? I think you have to make these luxury ownership of cars more expensive in a way. Maybe second car of a household, third car should be more expensive. You need to think of, of more rigorous policies. Well, I leave it here um, because I have too many things left. The last slide is that I think in Spain there should be more thinking about the division, national urban climate policy. And I think Spain should also try to involve all the municipalities to implement good policies, not let municipalities invent on their own, but try to set a standard for good policies at the municipal, municipal level to avoid competition between uh, regions and, and, and cities and municipalities to make sure policies are as strict as they can be. Um, and for the national level, I have the advice at the end, limit the number of climate policy instruments and try to focus on few systemic and stringent policies. Don't make your life easy by saying we have here 10 policies. No, focus on three policies and sell these policies as effective policies. Okay, this is where I stop. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we have time for questions from here, and also I think that there are going to come questions from outside. And I just wanted to, because I forgot to say at the beginning, you are also the editor of a channel which is called Environmental uh, innovation and, and evolution, isn't it? Environmental innovation, societal transitions. Yeah. yeah. Again? And societal transitions. Yeah. So it's a, well, you are the main editor. Well, right? I just editor. stepped down officially, I although I'm doing a lot okay. of work still. I just stepped but down. But you are in probably summer. still influential in it. So I think it's a, well, it shows what your interests are, which are quite wide about transitions and evolution. Uh, I want to ask to say something about because you have this integrated vision in which you say that carbon policies or carbon yeah, policies with market to taxes are the main issue. You have been saying this for some time, right? And there are other questions, right? Well, technologies, of course, that the evolution of technologies, for instance, if batteries can be done with sodium and not with lithium, this would be a jump in the... And this seems Indeed. to be yes. happening. Mm -hmm. uh, then the question of population, stopping the population growth, which is, I don't mean it as a policy, I mean that's something that is happening in the world. 
So we're going to top population, I don't know what, uh, eight and a half mi million or nine billion? More. Or nine and a half. But it's very important whether it's eight billion or eight and a half or nine and a half billion is very important. But this is happening. It's happening because it's clearly South India is not growing, North India is still growing, Africa is still growing. So this is something that it's outside the policy in a way, but could be more influential than a lot of the policies, isn't it? So if one is going to talk about mm -hmm. what are the prospects for carbon emissions and for the killing curve, are we going to reach 180 parts per million in the lifetime of the younger people here, or not, population, I think, is important. And the other is the growth of the economy. So you are famous because of your eight growth positions, isn't it? And George Scal is going to come to talk one day, probably, most likely, 95, likely that he will talk in favor of degrowth, isn't it? So, well, whatever happens, is not a, I don't mean as an mm -hmm. objective, I mean as a, something that would influence this. And then you are dismissed, as you usually do, with a lot of empirical evidence, the bottom-up people complaining against uh, coal, oil, and gas, which I think is growing. For instance, in the Gelende, in Germany, they're going, I think they're going to stop coal mining in Germany, which is an easy place to do it, isn't it, politically, even more now after the elections. So this, I don't know what to say about this, but I think that if one sums up all the movements around the world, or people complaining because local reasons quite often. Coal mining is not very nice for people. Coal fire power plants are very bad for health, isn't it? So if one sums all these other factors up, I don't know whether you could integrate even more. Mm -hmm. I remember whether it's true or not that Tim Bergen, who was your countryman, Tim Bergen, said one policy for each objective. Well, you have moved very far away from this, isn't it? But one could even move That's further true. away from this and say, what is the objective? The decreasing carbon emissions and everything helps. Yeah. And some of the mm. things that help, like nuclear power, perhaps have very bad side effects. So it's, of course, if you integrate too much, then you don't know what to say. Yeah. But this was the only question I wanted to say. And then I think it's interesting if, when George comes, because they have just published a paper from a master's student, I think, with George and somebody else, that the Gillette Jaune, the wet, yellow vest in France, which probably are used against your ideas quite often, isn't it? Saying you cannot convince, well, you could convince the yellow vest people if you give back part of the taxes to them, this would be your mm. counter. Mm. But they said that when you investigate with a sort of survey they have done, what they think, they have very varied opinions. Some of them was just like a social protest against the rich in a way, yeah. more than yeah. against carbon taxes. Yeah. So that's another point. And the, and the final point I want to make that I, I, I want to ask whether you have invented this EROC because the Eroi, we know who invented Eroi, and it was Charles Hall in the 60s. In they don't know what the Eroi is. Well, the it was in a slide here. The yeah. Eroi is the energy return on energy investment. It was this slide. I, I didn't mention it because. But the Eroi is the energy return on carbon, you said, isn't the it? The Eroi here, yeah. Yeah, energy I return saw on this carbon. 2015. Mm -hmm. That's a very good idea. I think many people. Yeah, this was. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, we in, even myself I was mm. not aware of this. Yeah, I think we invented it, but it, the people have used it maybe without realizing it. So it's it's they didn't give it a clear name. Um, because when we are going for coal, of course, it's so mm. good in the right and so no, bad on the indeed, indeed. Now, and you see here that. Uh, Coal has a bad reputation, but oil is not doing so well because of its ERO. Its ERO factor is relatively low, and that makes its ERO factor also quite low. And, and you see the difference with coal is not so big as people would think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a plea in favor of coal, but it's just to say it's more a plea against oil also. Um, 
And also with, with all, all the, the prices not signaling real scarcity, we may make wrong decisions. We've seen that also with um, uh, biofuels. For instance, in, in, when biofuels started, they were subsidized, and then they found out that some biofuel trajectories included uh, eroids that were smaller than one. That means you lose energy, you invest in something, and people didn't realize it because economically it was beneficial because of the subsidies. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that's stupid to subsidize something that is economically, but it can happen. That's why subsidies are always something to take care of. Uh, but I don't have to convince economists of that. We economists are, but outside economics, pop subsidies are very popular. Um, so you said a lot of interesting things. Juan is always like that. He has a very broad mind. So the population contribution to climate change, that's a good point. Uh, there was a study published recently that suggested that in the last 10 years, uh, population growth contributed to about 30% of emissions. And 70% was income growth. So that, but, and that might even shift more in the direction of uh, of population growth uh, in the future if incomes are going to rise in, in some countries. Mm -hmm. Of course, the main problem, if you look at the region that has the highest population growth in the future, it's, it's, it's sub-Saharan Africa. And one country mm -hmm. stands out, it's Nigeria. Nigeria will be the third most populous, populated country after China and India in the future. That, that's I I incredible. Yeah, so I don't know if these predictions are true. But and there are no checks there. I mean, it's the poor people who would... I also don't know, there's also religion there. I mean, what of course is happening in many of these countries is that child survival is relatively high mm -hmm. and people still have a lot of offspring. So yeah, then the, the reproduction rate is very high. Um, I have a paper uh, with a lot of famous people and I didn't write the main stuff of it, but it was a nice process. We wrote it in Stockholm and we concluded that both overconsumption in the rich part of the world and overpopulation in the poor parts of the world have a, a social dimension, social imitation dimension. So many people in our society consume a lot because it gives social status, because they see fashions, they, they see advertising. It's not basic needs, it is, we, we buy too much stuff. We buy too many, too much food, we buy too many clothes, we buy too much, mu too much music, too many books. Well, m maybe not too many, but for a scientist, <laughs> maybe that's bad to say. Let me take that back, <laughs> no. But in any case, uh, if you look at the overpopulation, traditionally we talk quickly about uh, preservatives, anti-conception, we talk about medical care, we talk about education of women and rights of women. But what is an important factor also in many parts of the world, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is cultural aspects. So in many local societies, if you don't have the average number of children, you're, an out, you're outlawed. If you have two children instead of six, you get in, into social problems, you get social resistance. Well, and, is, okay. and, and so, but it's very difficult to change social norms in that respect, because mm -hmm. they, they, they develop slowly especially also if there's religion, but it's not always religion, but it is it's often religious rules also. So in our paper we said we have to work on that as well, but it's not so easy where you start with it. And maybe governments, United Nations have to do something about it, but it's uh, interesting that there is a social I mean, dimension. I didn't uh, mean policy, I meant that what is really happening. Yeah. So some other of your points. Um, the Tinbergen rule is interesting, but I think if I talk about carbon pricing, I talk immediately about two instruments. I talk about uh, pricing as regulation, and I talk about revenues that can be used. So it's effectively already two instruments. Um, but there has been a lot of debate on this in relation to using the revenues to reduce labor taxes, uh, the double dividend, you know that debate too. And many economists decided that the Timbergen rule showed that it's not possible because you don't have two objectives. You have more objectives. You have uh, employment objectives, you have equity objectives, you have um, uh, environmental objectives. And so you have only two instruments and three targets. So you lack an instrument. That, that was one uh, conclusion. So the Timbergen rule is interesting, I think. Um, bottom up, uh, uh, complaints by local people. That's absolutely interesting. It's a bit far from my uh, line of research. I'm not sure if my work connects with that. What is interesting, you, you spoke about coal. A lot of people have bad life uh, in, in coal. Many people die, many people have health effects. 
Um, it's interesting to compare with nuclear because some pe people who are in favor of nuclear always say, look how many people died in nuclear and look how many in coal, and many more died in coal over time. So does that then mean we should give nuclear a chance? To be honest, I'm not so much worried about that debate because nuclear is not doing so well in eroid terms either. So nuclear is not such a good competitor. And after Fukushima, nuclear has to invest more in safety measures and concrete. So the era of, of after Fukushima has even gone down probably, not gone up. So, but I'm also not afraid to talk about, um, about that option. But I don't think nuclear has much future. But you never know, eh? if, if we are not realizing our climate targets in 10 years, you don't know what's gonna happen. The only problem is also that with nuclear, it, it takes 20 years to build it. Renewables can be built more quickly nowadays. So well, I don't think it's gonna get, uh, get, uh, become an important uh, technological option. And then A growth and climate, I guess in very brief, my A growth position comes out of having disagreements both with people who are very pro-growth and people who are very anti-growth. And I am critical of growth, but I am not anti-growth. In that sense, I'm, I, I'm a bit indifferent about growth. And I realized that at a certain moment, and that's when I decided I have to give it a name because people like to think in two camps. You're either in favor of growth or you're against growth. No, there's a third option. I can be indifferent. I don't care so much if GDP goes up or down. I care more for other indicators. Um, and I think it's important to move people in this direction because I see that a lot of opposition against good climate policies is because people fear it will harm growth. There's no proof for that, but just a psychological perception that it might harm growth is enough for people to not support. And even the people who say they believe in green growth, they don't really believe in green growth at the end of the day. It's paying lip service. It, you're, you're doing nicer in politics if you say, I'm in favor of green growth rather than I'm in favor of growth. It's easy to add the, the adjective. And then you are a friend of the environment. But when green growth turns out impossible, many people let go of green, not of growth. So to, to fight all that cheap thinking, because it is for me cheap thinking, it's not thorough thinking, I came up with the, th the thought of A growth. And the interesting thing is that if I talk to people about it, a lot of people, a lot of economists say, she, I can, I, I can identify with that. I never gave it some thought. I can identify with it. So I have hope it can grow a little bit, but maybe I should have a strategy there. Maybe you should advise me on how to... Yes, yeah, the agnostic school. And then uh, I think there are questions, but there is also a question. I think I should give the word because I am the, the only person able to read a question in the chat, which is a bit long. It says, you, haven't, you cannot read it. It says, no. carbon... Carbon tax uh, is on the carbon tax, which would put up the price of high carbon goods, no? yeah. of carbon intensive goods. They would go up. And therefore, people would substitute a way to low carbon goods. And then comes the question. Therefore, the prices of carbon intensive goods should go down if there is so much money available. Is there any evidence of it? Well, no, because the, the effect is too... Well, I, I don't know the effect, no. Also because uh, carbon prices have only been implemented in some countries, some regions, so there's not really international demand-side effects that are significant. But, yeah, you, but the, I think these effects will be second-order effects. And as economists, we also know that second-order effects are always smaller, tend to be smaller than first-order effects. So maybe, let's say, you have a carbon price that raises the price of a product with 20%. Maybe then, after there's changes in demand, there will be an adaptation of the price with 2%. I can imagine that. I, won't, I can't imagine that there will be a complete uh, rebound uh, so that the whole price effect will be undone. Okay, let's see whether the person yeah. replies to me. <laughs> What's an interesting uh, theoretical yeah, question? I think there are questions here. Three questions for Jordi. Ah, viene, viene la microphone. I think we have like 20 minutes left, isn't it? Sino, un, un petit comentari sobre la comparació entre impostos i, i mercats de permisos de contaminació. <laughs> 
Bé, jo soc molt més partidari dels impostos, perquè em sembla, tot i que soc conscient que s'està perdent la batalla, perquè tant a la Unió Europea com i ara més si ha començat a la Xina a implantar-se mercats de permisos de carboni, d'emissió, és molt difícil revertir això i que es torni. Però també és bo, per exemple, recordar que en realitat la implantació de d'un mercat de permisos a la Unió Europea, que es va decidir el 2003, de fet és el resultat d'un fracàs, del fracàs de posar un impost sobre el CO2 que ja l'any 1992 s'havia proposat i que van haver països com Espanya que van vetar-lo, diguem-ne. I després es va introduir d'una forma que, entre altres coses, no es venia els permisos, sinó inicialment es distribuïen gratuïtament, amb la qual cosa hi havia beneficis caiguts del cel per a moltes empreses. I la realitat actual és que, com has dit, ara sí que fa mesos que està a uns nivells elevats, però fa molt poquet, estava a 5 euros la tona de CO2. Llavors, l'experiència de la Unió Europea jo crec que no ha sigut tan tan positiva com es pot pensar, perquè estem en una situació en la qual hi ha hagut una gran inestabilitat de preus, o sigui, des de 5 euros a... que és veritat que es podien fer mecanismes com posar un preu sol per intentar combatre això, però en qualsevol cas, en un mercat de permisos no pots directament decidir que el preu, que és el senyal bàsic al qual s'han d'adaptar els agents econòmics anirà a pujar. De fet, ho hem vist amb l'experiència de la Unió Europea i de fet si s'ha aconseguit els 60 euros és gràcies a una intervenció massiva per limitar les subhastes de permisos i per retirar permisos del mercat, la qual depèn de decisions polítiques que també poden variar fàcilment. O sigui que això de que els impostos és més difícil que es mantinguin. Jo crec que els impostos, de fet, són més transparents, més fàcilment aplicables a tothom, perquè no oblidem, i hi ha menys costos de control, perquè no oblidem que el mercat de permisos a l'Unió Europea, que és l'experiència més avançada, recull un 50 o 60% com a molt de les emissions. Totes les empreses petites estan excloses, cosa que automàticament no passaria si fossessin. Bé, penso que hi ha molts arguments a favor dels impostos, encara que era i és més políticament difícil implantar-los, i molt més amb la situació actual de que la cosa ha derivat molt més als mercats de permisos, però encara segueixen havent empreses que reben gratuïtament permisos. És que llavors tot això penso que és un instrument més superior en molts aspectes als impostos. Ja mira, deixar que la present... Ok, jo, jo sé que amb això et dedicaria... Sí, fem això, les preguntes, sí. I a més, com penso que té raó també, millor deixar-li... Hello. So, I will make you some very basic questions because I come from, not from the research, but from the corporate world and I think, I mean, your presentation was very interesting and very theoretical and I would like to see how this can be used in the corporate world. So, some basic questions would be, the only price of carbon comes from taxes? is the only way uh, we calculate the price of, of carbon. So that would be one, one question. Second question, is this something transparent? So everybody knows the price of carbon. Is something stable? There is a market and, and the price for that. And then, do companies know that cost? So if I'm manufacturing a pair of jeans, for example, is that a clear cost for me? Because I think that, that that would be an important point. At the moment that companies know exactly the cost of carbon, then maybe it would be easier to give them incentives to reduce that cost. Mm -hmm. Maybe nowadays they just pay for some tons of, uh, of 
of carbon, and they don't know exactly how this affects to their profit and loss accounts. Uh, this, this could also help to show that to, to, to customers, maybe, and to, to be more transparent, to, transparent toward customers. And so it's, that would be some practical um, approaches to, to, to your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want another one, or you want to? No, yeah. I just go to, we can do three questions, maybe. Oh, hi there. Hi. Uh, as always, a pleasure uh, listening to you. Uh, I have just a, a, more than a question, a suggestion for you to, to elaborate a little bit more in the part that it's more on the Spain, Catalonia, Barcelona. And so you haven't talked that much about electrification and about the idea of self-generation self of electricity that may play a big role. So I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on this? So what's the, what's the role of this? So electrification and Electrification the and self-generation. Self oh, self yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, which are two issues that seems to be important and, okay. and that are very related to, mm -hmm. to the problem with the high price of electricity, right? So if we were talking about high price of, of, of energy, I would not be that concerned. High price of electricity, that bothers me a little bit more, right? Because we are not talking about high price of, of, of petrol or gasoline, right? So that's, uh, yeah. that's something that, yeah. is, that is important. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, perhaps the last question and then we can... Okay. No? Aquí, aquí. Bé, eh, puc parlar en català, no? Sí, sí, jo entenc català. Eh, el meu anglès està bé. Però que... sense màscara, mio, perquè... <laughs> per... <laughs> Vas ba baixar el màscara, sí. per... mio, mio, merci. La seva referència a Barcelona m'ha colpit perquè jo visc a Barcelona i soc molt conscient de que hi ha contínuament a tots els carrers petits, grans i, i mitjans, cotxes parats amb els motors engegats, salvo els que permeten per la tecnologia que es pari un motor, cosa que passa amb uns pocs eh, les marques. Em penso que tenim un problema de planejament urbanístic a Barcelona i de gestió urbanística. Primer, encara que se'n va parlar molt, no hi ha grans partits al voltant de les ciutats. Se n'ha parlat sempre, molts alcaldes ho hem, ho hem assenyalat. Sí, ara sí. Uh, Segona qüestió, Barcelona, a més, a part d'altres problemes que tenim a la ciutat, tenim una ciutat escanyada en els carrers, el qual contribueix a que els cotxes, a més, entre la ciutat, cosa que no haurien de fer la majoria, salvo casos que, evidentment, són normals, estiguin parats i, a més, amb una sola línia en carrers que permetrien molt més de mobilitat. Bé, jo crec que tenim un problema important de gestió urbana, a nivell municipal. Madrid segurament no és ben bé aquest model. La pregunta que un es fa és, donat que a Barcelona es parla, i suposo que de bona fe, que s'ha de ser com a ciutat, ciutat modèlica amb temes mediambientals, i per això hem mogut la bicicleta, hem posat els patinets, etcètera, etcètera, no me'n llegarem aquesta qüestió que és una mica periodística. Realment, la consciència urbana la consciència dels ciutadans de la ciutat és prou procliu a fer més coses que anar amb els cotxes on hi van, cosa que, evidentment, jo detesto que tinc el cotxe sempre aparcat en un garatge i només pot sortir de Barcelona, com altra gent fa. Però la gran majoria és el contrari. No crec que la política seguida per l'Ajuntament, tot i les declaracions enfàtiques, afavoreixi cap visió d'una societat encaminada cap a un futur més verd, més pacífic, més poc contaminat. Ok, gràcies. Merci. Em sembla que has de contestar perquè si no passarem de la... Jordi had a good defense of carbon taxes and I agree with almost all his arguments but I could also raise more arguments in favor of carbon markets and we had this discussion. So then the question is how much weight do you give to each argument because both instruments have advantages and disadvantages and for me, I guess... The two elements that I see as most important is um, that it's away from politics once it's institutionalized. It's not sensitive to political winds. Um, and that's extremely important because uh, a, a new government, 
cancels a carbon tax and then the whole system is down. And in Europe, they, we haven't seen those movements, not even from the countries uh, with, with political regimes that are, are not very sympathetic to these ideas of, of climate policy, but they, they let it, they ex have accepted it, and that says a lot. And the other is that uh, carbon markets are easy to integrate, and I believe it's necessary to integrate policies to have harmonized policies that you can slowly make stronger. And with taxes, I have a hard time seeing that. Should we have a global tax, a European tax, or a global tax in the hands of the United Nations who, who incurs the revenues? I, I see that far away. Whereas a carbon market, like the EU ETS, is not limited to the EU, ET, EU zone. We have already three countries outside the EU zone. We could extend it with China. We could extend it with North America. It's, it's in principle very easy. It's surprisingly easy technologically. And then it's, it's just the willingness. If the US would say we want to jo e join EUTS, it happens. It's that simple. But with taxes, I don't see that. And that's for me something that weighs heavier in the whole debate, you know? But I, I agree with many of your other points. That's not the issue. I can see the advantages of taxes. So if I would be a benevolent dictator and I would own the world, maybe I would put a tax finally, you know? But that's not the situation. Well, we can talk more later about that. Um, fr from the corporate world, that's interesting, your questions, I think. Especially um, the last one that you want to inform co customers about what is the component of carbon. To one extent, I understand that. Uh, and it might work, but it might also have the uh, opposite effect that you want to realize. Maybe people don't like that information. You also don't give in your prices information like, well, uh, that percentage comes from window cleaning. That comes from the transport. Why would you give carbon uh, cost uh, an exception? Why? For me, the most important thing, why I, I think it can work, is that firms know how to do accounting. Firms know how to calculate their cost and then make a, a sales price and make a little benefit, and they can survive. Firms that don't do that well, they won't survive. So I believe that firms can calculate the carbon cost through the carbon pricing. Uh, and, and, and then, but they don't have to know all the details. If they buy fuels or they buy energy and there is a carbon cost included already through the carbon pricing, they don't need to know. They will just see a new price and they will account for that price in their products. So the, the interesting thing is that the carbon price avoids that you have to know all that. What you see now is that there's a lot of discussion. Um, for instance, the, the government of Spain requires now from companies that they calculate their carbon footprint. But that's not so easy. That's really not so easy. That's quite a difficult task, and it's surrounded by uncertainty. And I'm not in favor, really, that we spend a lot of time because it's it's, it's unreliable information, and it changes from week to <coughs> week. And so I'm not so much in favor of that. It's very difficult to do. But if we have a carbon price, people will account for it automatically in their financial accounting. No doubt about it. You know, the same with eco labels. A lot of people say we should have eco labels saying how much emissions are there. Well, but if you look over the whole life cycle and it's a complex product, it's not easy to calculate it. If it's a, a, a complex product like a computer with thousand components that went through hundred firms, nobody will ever know how much CO2 emissions is there. You just don't know. That's a complex problem that nobody can solve. And if someone says, I know it, I distrust it. But if there's a carbon price, I know that all these companies will make sure they make a profit, so they will charge always the carbon price in their, in their cost price, otherwise they won't survive. And therefore, I trust carbon pricing more than LCA and, and eco-labeling, you know? Apart from the fact that LCA, life cycle analysis, and calculating all this and doing the eco-labeling for all the millions of products that we produce is, is complex also, and it will create a cost for society too. So that's another argument why I believe in, uh, in carbon pricing. Um, Umberto, yeah, the electrification and self-generation. It's interesting, I had a debate with Georgios uh, we supervised a student, a uh, postdoc together, and he, Georges had read a book that said that electrification would reduce emissions just by itself already. I still don't know why that is, but it's an interesting argument. And, and of course, if we want to go to a society where uh, we depend a lot of, on, upon renewable energy, electrified energy, electrification is important. Uh, 
so far, I know what I always know, but I'm not an expert on these technologies, that cooking with gas is more energy efficient than cooking with electricity. Mm -hmm. So I, I can imagine that for many, because gas is not transformed, it's direct. It has to be transported. Electricity also has to be transported. I don't know if the, I think the losses for electricity are serious, for gas not, but they're still a physical process, so you have to put in energy. If that works already for my cooking better for gas, I wonder if you can find many examples where it works better for electricity than... So I'm not convinced that electrification in itself is important, except for eh, running machines on, on electric, electric sources of energy. The self-generation is another uh, interesting one. I'm also a bit skeptical about that because um, I think there's a lot of economies of scale to be gained in creating energy plants with a lot of solar PV. If everybody, uh, I see now houses in my neighborhood that have two panels, little panels, mm -hmm. but they need an installation in the house also to make sure all the connections are made and is transformed. Mm -hmm. And nobody has done an, an energy analysis of all that equipment. So before you gain that back, uh, I, I, I'm not 100% sure that that's the right scale we have to do it. I, I, I'm not against it, but the incentives should be good there. But I, I believe more that we should go large scale in energy, uh, well, in, in electricity plants with solar PV and windmills. I, I believe that has more future than putting all the houses with uh, electricity. But I'm not against it. But I, I, I have not so, so high expectations as some people have of that. I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of it. Yeah. But we can maybe have other, maybe that, that doesn't answer your question completely, but, yeah. but we can, okay. And then the last question, I, I'm not sure if I understood it completely, but uh, I had similar ideas, which I, I didn't mention, is that what, what, what I, as a, I have a car and I drive in Barcelona sometimes, and what I know, always notice is that it's easy to drive fast in Barcelona which is not good in the city. And one reason is that they made one directional roads everywhere. And if there's like four lanes, uh, then uh, and there's not too much traffic, but even if there's much traffic, there can always be a lane that goes faster. And it surprises me how fast people drive in Barcelona city. Um, and I would say also all this one directional road leads to a lot of detouring. So it, it, this, it's a habit, it's, it's, it's quite common in Spanish cities to have one line, even I must say that in, they once uh, made new roads in my neighborhood and one was so broad that I thought it was two directional and I was driving there and someone stopped me. This is one directional. And I said, but there's no traffic here. Why didn't they make it two directional? Uh, but since then I didn't do it, of course, but I, uh, yeah, it's, it's a habit and I think it's a little bit a bad habit. But it's also true if you have then all these lanes that people park their cars there also, you know, blinkers, and so it, it becomes multiple use. Maybe that's good because it slows, slows down the traffic, so maybe there's an advantage to that. Um, but the situation of Barcelona is very car-friendly in a way. Yeah? It's, there's also still a lot of free parking everywhere, and uh, even in, in, in many places you find paid parking, and then immediately the side of it is free parking zones. And that's also strange. You should plan that better. You have all paid parking, or you have free parking, but then th there should not be over demand, because you know if there's free parking, you can notice where there's free parking, there's, all the parking spots are, are filled, and if one is empty, immediately someone goes in. So that means that person was searching. So that person was driving probably quite a lot of distance before he or she found a parking spot. And all these things are very inefficient and oh, yeah, use a lot of energy unnecessarily. I don't think we can solve our problems with improving that, but it's worthwhile to make the system a little bit more efficient, I think, and there are opportunities for that. No. Okay, I'm sorry, but we have to finish because of the time. And I think it would be very interesting to go, to have a, in the society on the ecological economics group a discussion about this issue of, of uh, solar energy in the homes, because this is booming now, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. including myself, for instance. And, and I think it has a lot of pedagogical effect. So I know a village where there are a group of the lampista, no? The electricists of the village now has created a small firm and they call themselves els quatre elements. I van posant això per tot arreu. I it's a lot of training on something that nobody knew very much about how many kilowatts of power and so on. 
and look also this to the this to the to, 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 to the electricity to grid. The rest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And I don't think it needs much. The only thing is that all this comes from China and so on. As far as I see, for the production side, nobody. Yeah, and probably it's going to last for ten years or or fifteen years, and then you have to. It's not very durable. And so well, and also it's produced with uh, coal electricity. Yeah, yeah, I know. You know so, and, and that's all also. No, no, a lot of metals is strange. Now that's why carbon price is also good to select among the cleaner technologies, the clean technology, because we talk easily about clean technologies, but they're never clean. Electric vehicles, batteries, solar PV panels are quite pollutive, and there will be later a huge recycling problem if you have them large scale. So to select among those, the ones that have fewer emissions, is also not a bad job But for instance, in St. Kirsten, I'm sure people put in this, that they are putting more electricity in the grid than they are consuming. If they have, if three, they have a big roof and they put a lot, it could be a... If they three or four kilowatts hour, yeah, yeah. that's what happens. So it's something that will come, I think, also. But I don't know, it would be interesting to discuss in a more serious way what... Yeah. With more expertise. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. it's interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming and thank you. Thanks. And I think we had like at least 10 or 12 people on the web and somebody who's thank you very much and no more questions here. Okay. So thank you to you. Thank you very much.